gentle and modern primates. My name is Erica, also known as Gutsit Gibbon, and I'm so glad that you're here with me today. You might notice that it appears like we're trying something a little bit different, and that is kind of the case. I'm kind of doing a, a little bit of a, a, a sort of a live reaction video, and when I say live, I mean live for me, not so much for you. This is all pre-recorded. I'm speaking to you from the past. Um, and I'm also using a new software. I'm using a software called OBS, which, uh, thank God for the Godless Engineer. Uh, ironic, I guess. Um, John helped me out with figuring out the ins and outs of this program, and it, it works a lot better than starting a Zoom meeting and being by myself in it and sort of going from there or using the camera app that's already uh, uh, inside my computer, which is just not that great of a program, honestly, or not that great of software. Anyways... Today, if you can tell from the background, we are looking at a video by Genesis Apologetics. Really, really kind of a mid-tier creationist organization. We're not dealing with, with the head honchos like AIG or ICR. This is, this is kind of mid-tier along with maybe like Living Waters. Um, and I had this video recommended to me um, by someone who I, I suppose doesn't like me very much because they're putting me through this. Uh, but in turn, I am, of course, redirecting my aggression as some primates do and forcing you to enjoy it along with me. So if you can see this, this eye in the background, a closed eye, um, this, this, this is going to be the video we're looking at. And you'll notice if you can see that eye that it is an hour and 51 minutes and 48 seconds long. So we're not doing this all in one stretch. We're going to do it in little incremental pieces, but, um, and they have the pieces on their, on their, uh, sort of YouTube channel. But I kind of like the idea of looking at it in full movie form because of course it, it says full movie and I find that quite hilarious. I like the idea of, um, sort of evangelicals getting the family around the TV and putting on the debunking the seven myths about the Bible, Genesis, and Noah's flood, popping some popcorn and hitting play on that bad boy. So, I, I just think we ought to jump right in, shall we? I mean, this this is going to be a fun time for uh, for all of us. And we, we might get to one of the first myths today. We might not. And we might save that for uh, for next time. But between you and me, I'm I'm thrilled. So let's begin. Is it possible that the world surrounds us with the conventional paradigm, a matrix about our origins and history of life on Earth, a reality matrix reinforced by education? movies, television, museums, and... I, I want you guys to appreciate quite briefly that they included in their list of sort of bad movies, like movies that are, are part of the, the big big evolution, uh, big biology kind of uh, uh, Illuminati. They've included The Croods, which is like a, a fun DreamWorks movie that is quite vibrant and enjoyable. Pull up a nice uh, picture, picture for you up here, because it's... It, I found it fun. Of course, I'm biased because I love all animated movies, but, you know, it's got a bunch of cavemen type hominids and, and some ambiguous, non-real organisms that live. It's, it's a fantasy. I mean, this is not, no one is coming around and saying that the Croods is like a legitimate representation of, <laughs> of, um, of uh, Neolithic or, or prior history, but they also include Lucy, which I'm, I'm fairly certain has almost nothing to do with, <laughs> with, with evolution, at least in, in sort of a past scale, maybe in the future. I actually never saw the film. I just, I was kind of turned off by the whole 10% of the brain myth that it proposes, but um, really myths in general kind of rub me the wrong way if it's not like cryptids or aliens or ghosts, <laughs> which is terrible coming from someone who enjoys um, empirical science. I tweeted about that the other day. Go like my tweet. Follow me on Twitter. I demand that of you. Um, all right, let's continue. And secular institutions, one that entirely discounts the credibility of biblical history as plainly written. Is it also possible that this we appreciate this this production quality? It doesn't take all that much effort to complete the rotation of the text. Worldview has slipped into many Christian colleges that have morphed biblical truth to be relevant to the culture of today. Join us now as we look at seven myths that the world and even many of today's Christian colleges espouse. These include, while the Bible may be inspired by God, it's not inerrant and parts of it are just myth. The Bible this more redactions than like an SCP, an SCP article. <laughs> account of creation is only metaphorical. 
The six creation days were not ordinary days, and creation really unfolded over millions of years. Genesis 1 and 2 provide two different accounts of creation. Adam and Eve were not real people, only allegorical figures in the story of human evolution. The Bible's account of Noah's flood is just myth and was drawn from writings from the ancient Near East. Moses did not actually write the first five books of the Bible, and dinosaurs died out millions of years ago, did not walk with man, and are not mentioned in the Bible. Before expl So, I, I mean, I would agree that... that <laughs> I would agree with all those statements. I mean, I think you're going to find a far and few um, sort of biblical scholars that are actually agreeing with most of the, the theology-based stuff. And um, I certainly don't know anybody with, with a, any degree past undergraduate that thinks dinosaurs um, walked with humans and, and I'm kind of in, engrossed in academia right now. Uh, maybe they exist. I mean, obviously they do. Most of them work for AIG, but I mean, or ICR or the other one. But um, I think they've kind of got the, uh, the monopoly on those guys. <laughs> Exploring these, let's first look at why these topics even matter. Jesus said we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Yes, we see plenty of Christians today who are passionate about their faith. But when it comes to being committed to... Let's, let's go back for a moment and appreciate this sort of vaporwave aesthetic from, the, uh, from this dude here. Wait, oh man, it's not going to let me go back, is it? Wait, maybe. Yeah, I will. Let's first okay. look at okay. why these topics even matter. Jesus said we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength. This dude right here, you've got like your nice neons. That's that's very um that's very modern. You're gonna you're gonna find a lot of that in this um in this kind of video. I, I've seen bits and pieces of it. I haven't seen the entire thing. Uh, but they do a lot of ripping nice graphics from like actual better production companies uh, and, and just kind of um, half-heartedly throwing in a credit at the top sometimes. And mind. Yes, we see plenty of Christians today who are passionate about their faith. But when it comes to being committed to the validity and truth of the Bible, sometimes their minds are just not on board, weakening their Christian walk. Many it's the ones who are on board that take into account both both the reality of, of the world around them and, and ensure that it's parsimonious with the scripture that they read. Um, these, these are like most Christians, actually. I'm, I'm pretty sure the statistic that it's like, hold on, what percent of Americans believe except evolution? Okay, let's see. What do we got here? How many creations in America? This is a this is a recent poll. Oh man, this is gonna give us the you know th this is great practice. You guys always make sure you're using the most uh, up to date literature. Okay, let's see. Pew Research Center as usual. Pew Pew's always the one who's doing it. Okay, people who respond whose responses uh groups whose responses vary by question format. Groups whose responses who don't vary. Okay. Two questions, 66% believe uh, they existed in present form that are white evangelical Protestant, black Protestant, and then Catholic. Let's go with all U.S. adults. Ah, oh, isn't this nice? Even with the two question, even with the one question, or rather with the two questions, that's, that's what I meant to say. We've got that nice 68%. This, this number gets better and better every year. Um, I am not an anti-theist, but I am definitely an anti-creationist. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, this, the, I, this, I find this very off-putting. If I were, were a Christian kind of doubting my faith and I were to come and stumble upon this video and look for, for guidance, this would be quite off-putting to me. Um, but at least this, this goat here is quite cute. Um, that's the positive. Many Christians today aren't quite sure what to do with the obvious claims of the Bible, such as creation, the flood, and the many other miracles that even Christ himself taught as real. You know what, that actually might have been a sheep. I'm not sure. Real historical events. Many students are dragging their minds far behind in their walk of faith, being surrounded by the competing views offered by. Look at this. Look at this. They hit on our boy, the Croods, twice. And then Missing Link, that's a charming film. You should see The Missing Link. It's, it's. They're really just digging on it because of the title, because really and truly, um, it's about like Bigfoot, right? In the North uh, Pacific Northwest. Yeah, Pacific Northwest. Um, and 
throw shade on the new Planet of the Apes trilogy and, and see what happens. I love that that trilogy. And honestly, James Franco is excellent in the first one, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And I'm not even a huge James Franco fan. He just, he looks like he might rub me the wrong way. But I do like him in that film. And Andy Serkis in the motion capture is incredible. I, I just, these are all great films, okay? I mean, you're missing out if you're just gonna, even if you're a creationist, enjoy the films for what they are and just pretend that it's fantasy. That's what that's what a lot of people do when they see videos like debunking the seven myths about the Bible. They take them as, as fantasy. That was mean, that was mean. By worldly entertainment and secular institutions and education, where they are subjected to 250 pages of evolution teaching over 50 classroom hours before they even... <laughs> Ah, yes, the three enemies of, of uh, modern-day creationism, ancient civilizations, life science from California, and, of course, the standard biology textbook. These are the three scourges, the plagues that you must work, look out for. I love, they're, they're really, they're really gonna, they're really gonna bust 20 pages on ancient civilizations. Like, that, that's, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit excessive, I would say, on their part. It's like, but I guess in anything that, that contradicts the paradigm, I mean, I, I get where they're coming from, I suppose. I don't agree with it, obviously, but... Sorry, you guys, I took a quick break to grab more tea. Hold on, let me, let me get this boy back up and running. Scripture even promised that scoffers would come uh. to suppress the truth and try to deliberately forget creation and the flood. The biblical... You know, Kent Kent loves this one too. Kent is a big fan of this. I've, I find that many, many creationists like to use this Second Peter three uh, verse, and I always find that it's it's a bit different when you look it up for yourself. So let's let's go ahead and do that. Second Peter three. Look at this, the NIV. We'll look at the KJV too because they love that one. Okay, so. Above all, you must understand that in the last days the scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything has gone on since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, God's word, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of earth and water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same world, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. So at first glance, I, I would agree that does seem to be uh, uh, sort of uh, illuminating their point, but there are a couple of, of little snafus. Um, one is that this is in reference, of course, to, to the resurrection, but also no, uh, the, generally the, the, the whole chapter, I suppose. But also this, the fact that the quote is where is this coming that he promised ever since our ancestors died everything has been going on since the beginning of creation um suggesting that of course they do so they do ex uh, uh accept a creation but then they deliberately forget that long ago by god's word the heavens came into being i think that's sort of the point of this is that they're not attributing creation to god's word um and then of course they talk about the the world of that time which of course if you look at the actual greek this doesn't, or not the, the not the Greek, the original Hebrew. I'm not actually certain about the Greek, but in the original Hebrew, world can mean local or, of course, global, which is the argument that like theistic evolutionists make. But the real biggie is this this verse that they just they cut it off for a reason, you guys, because the very next verse here in eight. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So time is meaningless to God. So this is the verse, at least, you know, when, when I was kind of espousing uh, a, sort of a, an allegorical interpretation of Genesis um, to my young earth creationism friend. I do still espouse that. I do think an allegorical uh, exegesis is, is sort of the best way to go. The John Walton Temple inauguration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this is the verse that I would always bring up. I had no idea it was so close to the, the, the classic Kent Hovind original. Um, but, but this kind of throws a bit of a monkey wrench into the whole literal days thing, does it not? Um, I'm not a theologist. They're, yeah, theologian. I'm not a theologian. So there are people who would certainly be able to kind of, um, kind of bust me on that. But certainly the intent here is that time is meaningless to God, um, which I think should be kept in mind by people like Genesis Apologetics at the very least. The biblical account of God speaking creation into existence is replaced with the secular view of deep time and random processes. 
Similarly, Noah's flood is replaced with long, slow, uniformitarian ideas. Because these competing views create mm. dis- Not replaced. There was no- there was no sort of flood geology paradigm that existed prior to, to legitimate geology when it was blossoming. There was a brief period where flood geologists were kind of uh, pushing what they were saying, but the actual sort of fathers of geology, at least in its current form, which would be Hutton and Lyle, um, they were like, the second they understood that things happen slowly today, they introduced the idea of uniformitarianism, and they were like, things probably happened slowly a long time ago, which means to get the things that we currently have, it probably took a little while. Um, so I, I don't really like this idea that it was like, you've got, you know, the, the medieval peasants talking about how, ah, oh, look at these in incredible strata that we see that were caused by, of course, um, rapid deposition in Noah's flood. Not, not precisely what we see, I would say. ...in their minds, many Christians are living a half-hearted faith, some without even knowing it. Many <laughs> This is like your stock bullying picture. She's just getting roasted by those four girls back there. And I guarantee you it's not because, you know, of her theological uh, sort of interpretation of Genesis. It's, it's probably because of these hot topic bracelets here. Well, actually, some of those are kind of cool. Many times, this problem gets compounded when they attend Christian colleges that place the Bible on equal footing with ancient Near East mythology. Spin the... It's not that they're on equal footing, it's that they, they straight up happened at the same time, so they, they're, they are, in essence, sharing elements of one another. Equal footing would, I suppose, imply uh, equal importance, which I very much doubt that Christian colleges are doing. Um, I don't even think like the guys like John Walton do that. Um, what they're essentially saying is that ancient Near Eastern texts can indeed inform quite a bit about why the Hebrews have sort of sort of the the uh, the, the tales that they have. Um, like that, the, why is the reason that the Epic of Gilgamesh shares so much in common with with uh, the the Genesis flood of Noah? Why is it that the Enuma Elish and the uh, creation story are so similar? And of course, you ask many biblical scholars, and they'll say, "Well, it's because the Hebrews were were held captive by the Babylonians, and you know, once they were freed, they sort of reclaimed a lot of their culture by taking Babylonian myths and and sort of um, retrofitting them to to be not about the Babylonian gods, but about Yahweh." This is the cultural statement, um, and there's quite a bit of backing for that if you really take about five minutes to look into it. But of course, these are the same guys that think the best way to read the Bible is in the KJV version. K J KJV? Yeah. KJV. I, I think I said KGV earlier. Whatever. The King James Version. Um, which, of course, is is not correct. You have to look to the original language to, to get the proper idea of what is actually meant to be said. This is in any ancient text, in any religion, or in any culture. Um, translating you know, a, a language is difficult. Translating a culture is much harder. And you have to kind of get this, this well-rounded idea of what people thought and what was going on at the time, or you're never going to understand what's going on. Ask a person in, you know, one million years if humanity lasts that long, if they understand what the phrase, it's raining cats and dogs means. Um, would they think that we're idiots and that we think that's actually something that happened and that in, in our mythos? I mean, they might if they didn't have any idea about our, about our culture and how we speak. Creation and flood accounts every which way and turn Adam and Eve into myths or allegories. To cope with these challenges, many Christians become theistic evolutionists, hoping to reconcile their Christianity with what their professors or classmates believe. Students don't want others to think they are closed-minded or simple by holding beliefs that appear to be... <laughs> we don't want them to think that we're simple, so we go ahead and just adapt our, uh, our theological ideas to include uh, uh, evolution. Um, no, they, they, the reason why so many college students who are religious um, grow to accept evolution is because they're given a much more standardized education about biology. Um, and local public school teachers can't just kind of push that a little to the side in the curriculum. It's, it's taught in Bio 101. It, it just is. Um, and when it's laid out nice and simply, people tend to not reject it. Funny that. Fairy tales by modern thinkers. Other yeah, students this guy's like, this guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> these challenges by compartmentalizing their Christianity as their spiritual side, or even identifying as New Testament Christians. 
All this because they don't believe that the Christian faith is based on real history, beginning with the first page of the Bible. Would Christ well, much of the Bible is based off of real history, and by that I mean there are, there are events that certainly are corroborated in sort of extra-biblical sources. Um, just probably not the literal, like, talking snake and, and sort of things of that nature. Christians live out their faith with more boldness if they really believe that the Bible is true, both theologically and his. That night costume was sweet. I hope they got like the intern at Genesis Apologetics and they were like, oh yeah, Barry, we're, we're going to need sort of like a, a, a sort of the spirit type uh, night outfit. Um, and the kids, they really like Game of Thrones. So we're going to need you to go ahead and, and lug this night costume that we purchased off of Amazon um, all the way up to like northern Canada and get a bunch of really good shots of you, you know, wielding the sword. Uh, the, 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 the winter is coming, except instead you can you can say something like, ah, revelation is coming, uh, something um, sort of relevant. And, and then Barry's like, are you serious? You, but you don't pay me. And they're like, yeah, but we're going to go ahead and need you to do it anyway. Historically, if their hearts, souls, and minds were all in, what would happen if Jesus came to earth and took 100 doubting Christians into a theater and played a movie that replayed history from the beginning? Cre a lot of them would be like, oh, cool, uh, that's... That's the Big Bang and that's evolution, just just like I was taught. Um, boy, it sure is good that I was I was uh, doubting my evangelical upbringing. Creation Week, the flood, and major biblical events that happened after, all the way to today. Would those Christians leave the theater and return to life as usual? Certainly not. This is because evidence that confirms God's word translates into a committed belief in one's mind. In this belief, <laughs> the reluctance. Putting that mask back on. God, it must be so cold. Emboldens Christians to live faith-filled lives. Fully believing and obeying God's word also opens the door to blessing. No, we're not promoting prosperity teaching here. We're talking about what happens when a person makes a conscious decision to order their lives after biblical teaching and makes choices that align with God's word. For God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. We're talking about Christians getting onto the right train tracks for their lives and journeying to their ideal destinations because... Can someone please fill me in on why an interpretation of Genesis, Genesis 1 through like 5, or, or whatever, 7 if you're including the flood, I think the flood ends in 7, why does that matter if most of the applicable teachings are in the New Testament? Why are why is this such a hill for these guys to die on the the the, the creationists so to speak? Um, I have a sneaking suspicion that a lot of it, for, at least for a, a significant portion, it's it's like an ego thing um, because people don't like to think that they're not special from the other animals um, because we're apes. Everyone watching this, you're all apes. I'm an ape, um, and that's a cool thing, not a bad thing. I don't know why people. Tend to, tend to not like that, um, except I do know, and it's because they want to be special, um, set apart from the rest of the animal kingdom. And in part, that's kind of the same attitude that's that's causing a lot of our issues with, with the climate and with the environment, because people just believe the earth is, is ours to take um, instead of instead of to kind of be a part of nature. They want us to, us to be set apart from it um, and see it just as a resource, um, which is bad. Don't do that. Shame on you. If they're living their lives in ways that honor God and his word. Today's youth are only going to follow God's word if they believe it to be true. <laughs> That's this guy, this guy, right? This is my face. Every sentence in this entire video, I make this exact face, both internally and externally. Also, this, this poor lad still has his braces. I had my braces quite late as well. So, um, I, but, you know, the, the bummer here is that... He's, he doesn't look like he's over 18, so his mother probably kind of goaded him into doing this this sort of um, stock footage. I wonder if they knew it was in this this uh, feature-length film by Genesis Apologetics. Ooh, it is claims. No one's going to submit to a book of fairy tales. This is exactly why biblical apologetics is important, beginning with the first book of the Bible. Let's look at it this way. Christ okay, so basically the idea is it's the foundation that's why Genesis is so important. And so I reiterate, um, that doesn't really make much sense considering um, a lot of the New Testament was to, to do away with the old law, 
So as far as like teachings that are actually applicable to daily living, if you're a Christian, right, you're looking to the New Testament. You're not not so much looking to like Job or like Lot because those aren't great lessons because most of them involve uh, do thing that may be questionable or get smoked. Um, and, and sprinkled in there, of course, are, are, I suppose, lessons about like trust and, and you know, putting your, your obedience in God and things like that. But, but um, in, in quite intense, very hardcore settings that are, are um, certainly PG-13, especially that stuff with Lot, um, <laughs> I must insist that we bring it up. <laughs> if you get, get my, get my, my, uh, my drift. Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead. How do we know it happened? We weren't there. We can't go back and watch a rerun of it. We get that belief from the Bible. But wait, scientists today would say that a person can't rise from the dead. So shouldn't we reinterpret this event and say that it wasn't really a bodily resurrection? Bodily resurrection, he says. Sorry, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. Um, I've heard this one before. I think that there is indeed a great difference between um, sort of sort of proposing that every aspect of, of biology, geology, paleontology, physics, chemistry, astronomy, etc., um, is incorrect in favor of a book in the beginning of the Bible that many scholars consider to be exalted prose or, or sort of a, a hyperbolic narrative. Um, and, and considering all of that, taking that as allegory versus uh, the, literally the cornerstone of the entire faith, which is a, a one-time uh, massive intervention of, of death itself. Certainly, we don't see things rising from the dead uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I do think that, that that is sort of a little bit of a false equivalency, and I think most, most believers, right, would, would have that idea. Um, and the, again, most non-believers would as well, and of course everyone in between. Um, it's just the evangelicals that, that want to draw this line, and the reason that they're doing that is to try to, to pull those progressive religious people over to their side and say, well, if you accept science, you're a hypocrite, because, you know, the, the Bible basically is gawking at science quite frequently throughout its pages. But again, I think you have to consider the text sort of in its setting, in its original language, in its original culture, um, and and with the best intent of the authors in mind, and I, I don't think that you can do that when you're comparing like the resurrection to like Genesis one through seven. Same, Same with, with the virgin birth, birth, the miracles Christ performed. Most Christians would say, of course not, but that's exactly what a lot of Christians do with Genesis. It's the same thing. It's not for reasons why I just explained. Many Christians have no problem affirming the New Testament miracles of Christ. But when we get to the creation account in Genesis, where he created in six days, drew man from dust and Eve from his side, many say, oh no, science says otherwise. So, Also, the dust thing, interesting little anecdote about that. A lot of, I've seen a lot of takes where the, where the dust is sort of a, a, a literary device that's representative of like mortality, um, because then later God says, right, or I think it's God. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, for, for dust you are and to, to dust you shall return indicative of the fact that people die if they don't have access to the tree of life, which is, um, you know, sort of a part of this, what I perceive to be kind of a large scale uh, allegory for the sake of teaching a lesson, um, which is don't disobey God. That, that seems to be a common one in the Old Testament. Um, I wonder why it doesn't appear as much. It still does in, in the New Testament, but there seems to have been sort of a frame shift of, of culture there. Oh, it can't be so. They don't believe what the Bible says because of what modern scientists say. So they reinterpret the Bible. Not modern scientists. Modern data. Difference. Once we unlock that door, we unleash the same attack that Satan made on Eve. Question, did God really say? This attack, did God really say, was so effective in the garden that the enemy still uses it today. Evolution over millions of years. Ape men. No life after death. These ideas... Ape men is the same. I think Aaron Ra has made this commentary before saying ape men would be the same thing as saying like, like canid dog, right? We are silly. Men are apes, right? That's, that's just kind of a silly, they, they say that because it sounds much more sci-fi, much more science fiction. Lead people to question, doubt, then ultimately reject God's word. 
If people won't believe the history of the Bible, this undermines the authority of the Bible, and the gospel is based in that very authority. If we cannot trust the Bible's history, why would we believe what it says about salvation? If people won't believe Genesis 1, why believe John 3.16? There's, there's a thing, though, that creationists do when something is, like, outright just false, like things in, so that are sort of in, in, uh, uh, written down in like a poetic nature or something like that, they're very quick to be like, oh, no, 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 um, that's not the, the part we mean when we say take the Bible literally. We mean these parts um, that, that are sort of hiding in that, uh, have, hasn't necessarily been disproven yet. Um, but then you have things like, like the Exodus, which there's no evidence for it having happened uh, directly as stated in sort of, sort of in the Pentateuch. Um, uh, for one, Egyptians didn't really have slaves at corvée laborers, um, and, and that kind of seems to differ from the story that we find. It's it's an, the, you know, the historicity of the Bible, at least in its chronology, is kind of a, a different bag entirely. Um, but I, I don't know. I, this this just seems like a weird argument to me. This this whole thing where it's like, if you don't take the parts that we think are literal literal, then why would you take the parts that you already think are literal? literal that are that are meant to be um because no one is no one is saying that the new testament is like up for interpretation with regard to like was jesus a person who like died and rose from the dead no one is saying that um but many scholars place doubt in the intent of the authors with genesis it's just genesis interestingly enough which leaves again a whole mixed bag for like exodus and things like that um but but because of the language because of the context because of, of the culture because of a myriad of different reasons. So, so comparing these two things, like it's a one-to-one, -one is is poor scholarship, and it's very um, sneaky. Jesus even said, "I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things?" These challenges represent a key stumbling block to the gospel of Jesus Christ for many people today. The Bible also stresses that we should not be cheated by those in the world who tout philosophies that follow the traditions and basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ and his- What falls into basic principles, though? I mean, they're, they're basically lumping in things like evolution and the age of the earth into, like, basic principles, right? And, like, philosophy of science. But when you do that, you necessarily also bundle it with, like, a bunch of other principles of science that are pretty basic and, like, well-known and, and, you know, accepted by pretty much everybody. Um, and it's those basic tenets, be it those of medicine or cell biology or ecology, that give us a lot of the technology and medicines that we enjoy today. Um, so, bad move, Genesis Apologetics. For shame, shame on you. Go to the principal's office. His word. Indeed, the wisdom of God has made foolish the wisdom of this world, since the world through wisdom did not know God, with many being led astray and deceived by the so-called science of each generation. Such wisdom of this world... Mm. 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 I'm not sure I buy that. I'm not sure I buy this as, as a... As a correct interpretation. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. What do you guys say? What is that? First Timothy? Yeah. Because look at that. Okay. So in the NIV version, we have Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from the godless chatter and opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge which have been professed and in doing so have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. So here it says knowledge, right? Cool. Um, let's check the, let's check the KGV, shall we? KGV, KJV letters. <sighs> Can you imagine? Okay. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, so falsely called, etc., etc. So here it says science. Very interesting. Let's go even older. Hold on, where's the Geneva? There you are, 1599. And we have oppositions of science, so falsely called, again. So this is kind of interesting, right? This definition of science along with knowledge. Now, this is the definition that Kent uses, that science, of course, is knowledge, and, and that's why we, the, he doesn't consider like evolution and things science. But... What is science? 
The definition of science based off of its roots does indeed mean knowledge, but that isn't what we consider science in, in sort of our common modern tongue. So this is a classic example of taking something out of language and out of culture where it doesn't belong. Um, so for instance, science. Hold on, we need the, we need the basic definition. Definition, there we go, for kids. <laughs> All right, the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment, or a particular area of science, or a systematic organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. So, so the, the three basic definitions that we see when we Google this, of course, they don't fall in line with, with kind of um, what this translation is intending, uh, and also what guys like Kent kind of propose. So I don't think that Genesis Apologetics is being entirely honest when they're when they're using again this one to one. I also have in here, coincidentally, my uh, studying primates textbook, one of my studying primates textbooks, one of my many ones, um, which which speaks about the nature of science as well. Uh, in the first chapter, we introduce how science works. Science is an attempt to explain observations of natural phenomena such that we can predict future observations. That's not simply knowledge. That's knowledge with a bunch of caveats because, of course, there are many different types of knowledge. History would be considered science by the definition that, that we're given here, this sort of archaic means of thinking. Draws back into the mystery of unseen, unproven deep time to frame the theory of evolution far beyond when we can use true science, that which we can observe, measure, nope, and nope. repeat to and test such ideas. ideas. Finally, no, so evolution is of course observable today. It's of course measurable today, and it is of course repeatable today. The problem is this consistent goalpost moving because the organisms that we see evolution in observable, measure evolution in, measurable, and repeat our experiments in, repeatable, are in organisms that are small and have short gestational periods or lifespans, um, in, and of course microorganisms like uh, bacteria, bacteriophages, um, things like that, or very simple eukaryotes, um, also things like mice, birds, lizards, um, arthropods of many kinds, but they don't like that. They want to see one kind turn into another kind. They want to see a, you know, a duck turn into like a frog, right? Which is not even, of course, what evolution states at all, violating the law of monophyly. And of course, just so many tenets of, of how organisms change through time, how they, how they further specialize themselves or generalize themselves. Um, so this, this is just plain false, a, a true science. This, this honestly really irritates me. This kind of thing really pisses me off because it's, it's just repeating um, this concept that they should know better by now. And because they should know better, it always leaves a bad taste in my mouth that there is potentially some dishonesty going on here. Now, far be it from me to try to infer someone's intentions. I wouldn't try to do that because that's not what I believe is, is, is appropriate. It just very much seems that way. And I think that we should at least sort of have that in our periphery so that, that we observe skeptically when, when these kinds of claims are made. These topics are not important so we can have the satisfaction of winning arguments. Rather, they are important because believing in the clear message of the Bible firmly grounds and roots a person's faith, allowing them to build their lives in the solid, rich ground of God's Word. This is not the Word of God, though, that they're proposing. This is their interpretation of the word of God. I cannot emphasize that enough. I know so many Christians, the majority of Christians that I know, absolutely denounce all of this Genesis apologetics kind of stuff. They're, for the most part, by and large, theistic evolutionists, or at least old earth creationists, um, and, and for good reason, because they look into this kind of thing right? Um, of every walk of life, you've got professional scientists who are creationists, you've got evolutionary biologists and like um, uh, Francis Collins, um, things, things, things of that nature. Um, so I, I don't understand where, where they're kind of getting this. I do understand. I don't know why they're, they're proposing this massive ego boost that it's like, ah, God's word, man's word. They're, you know, pick one or the other, and then you don't want to pick the wrong side. It's like, they're, Genesis, up, or Genesis, well, checks, uh, AIG does this BS all the time, too, where they're, like, um, unequivocally saying their version is God's word. 
And that sounds a little bit like blasphemy to me, folks. And based their life decisions and choices in ways that are aligned with the Bible. Trees that have roots that drill deep into the soil draw life-giving nutrients and establish a firm grounding for when the storms come. Trees that start growing roots but hit a blockage that stunts their growth will not be able to access all the intended nutrients the tree will need to be healthy and fruitful. It will also not be strongly rooted to stand against the storms and testings that come. Hey Barry, listen, we know that you're a great intern and that you just got back from Northern Canada to do, to do our cool um, two-second night stock footage clips but we were wondering we need a we need a pick of like a fallen over a dead tree and like karen the secretary for for sort of our organization she was mentioning that like a tree fell down in her backyard the other day so could you go ahead and go film it like like for our um you know for, for our genesis of Jacks video and barry's like but the camera rental ran like ran out we don't have anything good to film it with and they're like eh, just do it with your phone so this is what we get <laughs> like good stock footage <laughs> garbage stock footage. This, I guarantee you, someone from the Genesis Apologetics team um, took in their backyard, which I find very funny. The leaves and fruit that are visible on the outside of a tree are a reflection of the invisible roots that are beneath the tree. Christians who place their trust deeply in God's word, trusting it back to the beginning in Genesis, will draw life-giving strength for their lives and will not sway and uproot when false teaching and See, but this one is much better. This stock footage is much better. Also, all of that is, we've already covered why rooting the faith in Genesis is just kind of odd. Challenges come. The fruitfulness of our lives and our daily choices and behaviors all stem from what we believe about God and His Word. The very first psalm in the Bible promises that if we delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on His law day and night, that we will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth our fruit in season, and that our leaves shall not... This is like the longest intro ever. We're, this is like an almost two hour video and we're eight minutes in. Still intro. Still intro. Wither, and whatever we do will prosper. All of these come from meditating and revering God's law, which is the set of the first five books in the Old Testament, beginning with Genesis. How deep do your roots go? Are you a Christian student looking for answers about what the Bible teaches about creation, the fossil record, dinosaurs? Download the Genesis Apol- This is a shameless plug, Genesis Apologetics. Shameless plug. But the good news is, I think this, this ad here um, means that we're, we're at the end of our intros. It's good timing, actually. Also, I just realized <laughs> I'm literally the world's biggest idiot. Well, who's the producer of this? Second biggest idiot. Um, this, this sort of logo here is actually quite nice. Like, they've got the- I think it's like the six days, right? So what is that? Let there be light, um, water, what is this, like, one of these is plants and one of them I think is animals, I think it's, I think this is plant, this is animals, like a trilobite. This yellow deal is like the sun, which of course is different from light, <laughs> for whatever reason. Um, and then you've got like the, the, like, what is this guy, like the Picasso down here with like a giant, giant ass nose, I mean that, that's fine, little ear. Um, that's not really doing great for like their whole humans aren't primates thing because because this looks a lot like a proboscis monkey. You guys know proboscis monkeys? These guys are great. Proboscis monkey. Fun fact for you guys, um, proboscis monkeys are known as Dutch monkeys in some locations because um, the, the locals thought that when they met the Dutch, they noticed that the, that the Dutch had large noses and reminded them of these monkeys. So they actually got the, the nickname Dutch monkeys. This is a nice, nice male here, and this is a, a lovely female. They're sexually dimorphic, so males are quite a bit larger, and males are the only ones that have like these absolute honker noses. Um, and they've also got like these weird pot bellies going on. I don't want to accidentally click on one where like, like so you can see one of the monkeys there has like an erection. I don't want to get dem I don't want this video to get demonetized before I'm even monetized. Anyways, let's con let's watch them consider consi uh, continue to shill for a moment. Apologetics app from the iTunes or Google Play stores for answers to these questions and more. Myth number one is what? Myth number one, boys, ladies, we did it. Apes of all ages. Um. So that's our intro. Now, my, my opening thoughts are not great. Um, I think we're in for, um, for lack of like a better word, like, like, a, like a bit of a shit show. I don't think this is going to go great um, for them. I think there's going to be quite a bit of, of 
misinformation, which is going to be very fun for us to, to kind of pick through um, and just sit back, enjoy ourselves, um, and and just kind of work our way through it. This is going to be some some fun content. And you're going to have to listen to me for quite some time because this video is, I'm almost certain, very long. Uh, and, and this is eight, almost nine minutes of, of, of Genesis Apologetics uh, uh, material, content, so to speak. Um, by the way, something that annoys me about Genesis Apologetics, you guys, is that they do a lot of, they have like a lot of re-uploads. And the re-uploads are like wickedly small versions of like previous uploads. I'll show you what I mean. Hold on. Ladies and gents, monkeys of all ages. Okay, we don't want to see their trailer. Um, <laughs> they've got like the mini version of the logo. <laughs> if you didn't know what it was, you couldn't tell what any of these things were supposed to be. Uh, let's see, the six days of creation. Uh, smokestack, lines, blue, curve lines, half of a mountain, rocks. Those are the six days. That's peak creation performance. Okay, videos. You guys are going to be hopefully as appalled as I am by this. So, so, so you see this 16 second video, uh, 15 second video, seven myths promo for churches and schools. Like why, why is the promo itself being posted? Why is this a 17 second video that isn't a promo, but shares the same thumbnail as this promo? Um, good question, Erica. I'm not so sure. And then, of course, we have all of the, the myths that are in the, their separate forms. Um, and, and should Christians watch movies like Harry Potter? That's, I don't even want to get into that. That's, that's not, that's just going to depress me, arguably just as much, because I knew people growing up whose parents were like that, and they ended up warped. Um, I'm sure you guys feel the same way. This would be a fun thing to go through at some time, this, this, <laughs> this guy, like, trying to, trying to, this creationist guy, like, trying to talk his way through, um, biological anthropology. Um, there's just so much content here that I could just go on and on about. This, I don't like these at all. Someone, I think Dapper D has already covered these. Um, they're very, very cringy. Um, it, it's, it's a lot, you guys. There's, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to unpack, um, but that's why we're going to do it together over the course of this series. So thank you so much for watching this first video. Um, like and subscribe if you haven't, although if you sat through this entire video, I would hope that you've subscribed by now, um, because otherwise you've wasted your time. All my content is like this. Actually, some of it is, has much higher production value. <laughs> Anyways, um, my, my, my lovely audience, thank you again. And I do hope that you have a, a lovely rest of your day. Um, forage strongly, uh, be, be good apes, um, be great apes.